Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. In this episode, I welcome Nathan Miller back to the podcast. Nate is the founder of Proving Ground, a digital transformation agency, and he specializes in collaborating with designers and builders to implement digital strategies for reducing waste, enhancing creativity, and making better decisions about the built environment. In addition to developing new software, like the popular Lunchbox plugin for Grasshopper and Dynamo, Nate frequently publishes writings about digital business practices, critical evaluation of technology trends, and ethical considerations influencing the adoption of new technology in the construction industry. There's also a very useful weekly workflow series running over at the Proving Ground blog, showing off how to implement their machine learning tools and Lunchbox plugins, for example, that caught my eye a couple of months ago. You should definitely check it out by following the link in the show notes. Today, we discuss the importance of maintaining a critical view when it comes to tools and technology, the need to evaluate new technologies and innovations carefully to determine if they align with your desired goals, the value of balancing established experience with new advancements, and fostering bi-directional learning between innovators and experienced professionals, the value of navigating the constantly evolving nature of technology and architectural design, the importance of learning from previous projects to drive continuous improvement, and other topics. So without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Nate Miller. I would love to just talk about Proving Ground. I'd love to talk about kind of how you got, because the last time we talked, we didn't talk about that as far as I remember. I mean, it was, it's a fuzzy time in history, I think, but um, I remember us talking about COVID and just like, it was great to have a conversation. And so yeah. like wherever it goes is wherever it goes. I don't, I don't actually like to set an agenda up front, but I would like to sure. show, you know, talk about what you're doing and you you know, you're doing the Lord's work. I'm sure. Well, <laughs> well, we can we can um, we can let the listeners decide if um, you know. Twenty, we did the first one in 2020. Yeah, and now we're in 2023. Has Nate become more or less anxious and unhinged in this in that in that time span? Because um, it doesn't really seem like crisis the crisis it, 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 of of world events has really ever gone away. No, you know. <laughs> You know, it's just sort of been like, just you know, there's just version. been more, yeah. there's just, yeah, different versions, more of them. And so yeah. your listeners can be like, whoa, <laughs> we thought, you know, he was on the edge in 2020 and now he's really, he's really taken the plunge. Um, I, I read something, Nate, that was like, uh, you get like more and more anxious and I know maybe angry, maybe like questioning until like age 55 is like the, the, the culmination of all that. And then, and then it just gets better. And it's like, it's some, something happens, you know, I'm sure that's just like some number that well, is an like, average, but. Well, it's like reaching the top of a roller coaster. You know, you're like, you're at the top. You're like, okay, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm, I'm 55 now. I'm just going to coast. I'm just, I'm on my way down. This is all someone else's problem. To hell with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, that's right. That's right. Well, that's, it's, you know, I'm getting there. I, I think this is all, this is, this is good to have a, have a combo. I, I turned 40 this year. Um, and I think that's, that's like, it's like, I didn't think it would mean too much, but it's kind of like in the back of your mind, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not in my thirties anymore. Right. And, and I think about, I think about technology and the, the space that we operate in and, you know, you're always told, you know, at least I always felt like, you know, when I was first getting into the, the architecture and computational design scene, you know, you'd have the, you know, the, the, the project, you know, the senior project manager or principal talking about, how, oh, he's, he's into the new stuff. It's a, it's a young person's game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm like the, I'm now I'm kind of get to be that, that older guy. I mean, like, yeah, you know, yeah, you, and, you're still and an emerging professional. You're still a, you're still a youngster in, in the architectural <laughs> profession. You have to, like, you have to have some serious gray hair to be considered senior anything. You know? Well, um, between you and me, I don't think I'll ever have gray hair. <laughs> 
<laughs> just between as, us. As, as, you can, as, <laughs> as you can tell, as you can tell from my haircut, I don't know. It could be gray right now. I, be, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Oh, I, I wouldn't it, know. It's like I grow my beard out. I don't actually. My wife won't allow it. But it, it, when I when it pokes out, it's like whoa! There, it's just white, man. Like what? <laughs> what happened <laughs> that's right <laughs> what happened where'd that come from <laughs> oh my god yeah it's it's uh it's eye-opening at, at that point sure you actually feel it so anyway yeah let's talk about proving ground let's talk about what you've been up to for the last three years two and a half years since we talked i mean that was uh that was an episode for the for the books that was like solid COVID time. We were just like getting our feet back under us. And I mean, so much has happened since then. And you are creating order out of chaos, which is the AEC tech sphere and maybe just the architectural profession in general, but like you, the tools that you make, the training that you provide, you know, you go in and, and, and you kind of do these assessments on firms and you, Mm -hmm. you you've always been kind of the champion of digital transformation when it comes to architecture using technology to its to its benefit so i mean let's let's talk about proofing ground let's talk about nate miller who is the the founder of and the team behind what what you're working on sure yeah you know it's proving ground turned eight years old wow. as a company um this year um and and before that, you know, if, you, if I really rewind the clock, Proving Ground was a blog, um, right? And That's even right. to like even to this day, yeah, you know, there's that blog element to it. And you know, if I think if I if I really think back to what what really motivated, I guess that initial genesis was you know maybe a idea of a a question on what can technology really do to benefit the building design originally the building design process because i was a designer at the time and right you know as as we all know when you're a designer that's all you can think about is design um and uh and it becomes kind of your whole world right but i think we've kind of broadened the scope of quite a bit in more recent years as we've been thinking about construction and, and operations uh, but it, it really did start as a as a way to sort of, and this is, I guess, the the name of of the company and and previously the blog, you know, to prove that this stuff, this new stuff, technology and computation and you know uh, tech uh, being the umbrella term can actually transform how we work to you know, toward you know to a better kind of state, mm -hmm. um, whether it's better design. Um, a better construction process or a better uh, life cycle management of of the the, our, the building. Um, and when when I first was like getting into this space, you know, the blog really was more of a journal than anything else. You know, you kind of have a set of 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 interest areas like, oh, what if you had a grasshopper definition help you plan your building and like what would that look like you know and and the you know you could actually probably go back to some of those early posts where it's like oh yeah you could probably do something with um novel uses of tessellation and and figure out relationships between kind of auto generated geometry and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. think about planning that way or you're using something like you know one of the one of the og grasshopper plugins kangaroo maybe can we actually use a physics engine to help us solve, you know, how spaces might come together mm -hmm. in, in some way. Right. And so it really was like this, this, um, this journal or diary of, of experiments, which eventually became, Oh, well, I'm going to write my own plugin, um, now. And, you know, either the first one I wrote was a plugin called slingshot, which was all about sending data out of grasshopper into a database and then lunchbox, um, which, if I rewind the clock, I think that was like 2010, 2011, uh, when the first release wow. of Watchbox was out. Um, and that one, that one was derived from like, I just wanted to go, I mean, in some ways it was kind of driven by, 
I just want to be able to get through this competition as fast as possible because I know I'm going to be doing paneling systems and I know I'm going to be doing a lot of complex geometry and structure. So can I create a plugin that will help me get through this without having to reinvent it every time? And that's what, yeah, that's what Lunchbox became. Um, and, you know, if I then kind of look at our current state, um, what I like to think uh, Proven Ground has become, you know, we're a company now, which is very different than someone sitting in front of the, the computer writing a blog. Right. Um, but a lot of that original, that sort of original kind of thinking from those days where you're experimenting, you're asking questions, you're looking at what can, what can a building design and construction and operations process look like um, if we were to uh, employ certain techniques or technologies um, has really been a driver for a lot of our work today. And, you know, that's kind of turned into different forms of service. You know, you mentioned the strategy side, which is super important. I'd like to actually talk a lot about that um, because it, it feeds into maybe some peripheral subject mm -hmm. matters related to what we're seeing happening today with generative AI and all that other stuff. And a lot of people are asking a lot of questions right now in their practices, yeah. like what, what is this going to do? Um, but you have the strategy side, you have, you know, building, continuing to build tools. Um, we've productized some of them. And that was really, I guess, that really started in 2020. <laughs> in some ways, that was a, that was a survival instinct in, in some ways, because we didn't know what was going to happen. And um, all of a sudden, our, tr our in-person training right. and in-person workshops and, and strategy just, just like gone. went away. Right. And so we needed to think about, okay, how can Proving Ground start to put itself out there in new and different ways? And that led to a segment of our stuff becoming more product productized and then different kinds of service, which allowed us to, mm -hmm. to do what we do um, in a capacity that didn't require us to be in the room physically. Right. Right. There's a lot there. I mean, I, I yeah. even think back to what you were, where you started with this online journal, basically. And I, I, my question is like, how did you decide to make that a public journal versus a private journal? Because I think there's, a, we've seen it all the time through it. You're, you're in a position where you're looking at firms and you're seeing the duplication of effort in every one of these firms. And I think one of the big reasons of the duplication of effort is people are not publicly dreaming about this stuff. They're not publicly hmm. talking about this stuff. And so therefore they're in their own silo. Maybe they're looking at what other people are doing, but because the majority don't publicly put out there what they're working on in the sense that you did with proving ground in the blog, I think that's just a very different approach. Why did you decide to go that route instead of keeping it to yourself? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know if I know the exact answer to that. I, I, I first started the blog right as I graduated from school. Um, and at the time it wasn't even called proving ground. It was just like, I, I heard of people starting, you know, blogs. I had mm -hmm. done like, I don't know, this has taken me way back, but pre, pre Facebook days, you know, it was all, yeah, right. I was like, what was it called? Live journal. Yeah. Um, I was doing that, uh, when I was in college, uh, early, early days of college and, um, you know, the Facebook became really popular when I was in college. And so in some ways I feel like that maybe just instilled a bit of like, okay, um, in order for, you know, if I think about where the world was going and how street cred, um, and career and things like that may be taking us, you know, where that might be going, it's going to be online. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, the starting a blog was, it served two purposes. One, for my own sake, I could track what I was doing. And, you know, maybe if there was some, some idea of trends and in, in the work that I was doing and what that would be. Uh, but there was also this idea that, um, you know, you could, you could kind of make a name for yourself by putting, putting things out there, especially if you're doing things that were really, really new. And at the time, tools like Grasshopper um, were really, really new. And um, there was there was a bit of a, in those early days of Grasshopper, and I think that it still persists to this day, 
it's a very community driven type of tool. Yeah. And I remember when it was in the first days of beta, you had a Google, a public Google group where if you wanted to learn anything about Grasshopper, that was the only place you could get any information because you had David Rutten writing the software. You know, he's like almost building an airplane while he was trying to figure out where to land it, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then you had all of these people like contributing ideas and throwing in example files, throwing in files that were needed for debugging. And, you know, you don't want to, I think in that context, you don't want to be the person to be like, okay, I'm going to take all of this and make like this really private thing. Um, you want to like absorb that information and put something else out there so you can maybe help shift and shape that community in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really a big driver um, for, for that. I think the idea of community, the community driven mm -hmm. development of the tools that I, were, I was using in combination with um, just a general cultural ethos around putting yourself out there in, in the, you know, right, right as social media was becoming super, super, um, popular, um, you know, gave, gave me that, that kind of platform with proving ground. Um, it's also where, where it seems like the, you, you found your tribe, right? I mean, that, that, that's the idea of an online community, but, but you, there's so many other people kind of in your cohort that I would assume kind of came out of you finding those people in that location online. Sure. I mean, I think, I think so. I mean, there's, there's the, you know, that it, if I think, if I think back to, you could almost get really specific here with, with the grasshopper stuff, but the original like kind of plug-in cohort, Mm-hmm that we're putting out tools that I think to this day are among the most popular. You have, we mentioned kangaroo earlier by Daniel Piker. Mm -hmm. um, you had uh, firefly uh, authored by people like Andy Payne. You have, um, you know, there, there are some that I, I don't know if they've quite continued on, you know, it, I think about, you know, stuff like late the, I think more recently, like the ladybug tools, that kind of, you know, it's a forward a few, a few more years, but you know, it's now one of those kind of staples yeah. of, of the, uh, the workflow. And then I'd like to, you know, put lunchbox in there too. You know, it's just, yeah. it's become one of those Absolutely. things like when people get grasshopper and people get rhino, they get those plugins I just mentioned in parallel with it. Right. Um, because that's what, you know, in some ways gives it, it's, um, it's juice, um, yeah. more, more than what's available out of the box. Right especially for architecture, right? I think that, yeah, there's, there's some key words when it comes to grasshopper that are the plugin names that you're mentioning, right? There's others out there as well, like human UI, or, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of examples, but human UI. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things where in architecture circles, there's kind of the usual suspects of, of grasshopper plugins, like you talk about. And I mean, I don't know if they go beyond that, you would know better than I would. Um, being the author of it, but, but architecture specifically kind of relies heavily, especially I would assume in, in school, like in, and really like form finding design exploration where everybody's a designer, those are going to be kind of the, the plugins that get passed around more than, more than others. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, like it, I think one of the things that has been very surprising, I'll take lunchbox as an example every now and then I'll get pinged on LinkedIn or um, some, you know, directly through email of someone saying what they're doing with the, the tools. I, I really have no insight into any, anything that anyone does. Um, <laughs> you're not creepy like that. You're, you're like, I yeah. want to see exactly which ones they're clicking on and how they're using them. Yeah. It's all phoning home. Yeah. That doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, and, and so, and so for, for context, I'm like, I'm pretty against a lot of that. So, um, even, even with our product stuff, um, if anyone is interested in knowing that side of the philosophy, we don't track anything. Um, and, and so the only way I know if someone's doing something cool with it is that they, you know, say, Hey, Nate, look what I made. Yeah. But the original point, 
um, I've, I've had people that are designing automobiles showing me something they did with lunchbox. Cool. And I was like, you're using lunchbox, pa- like the paneling stuff to do a cool pattern on like a Ford, like what, or you cool. know, some other, uh, and then, and then, uh, I, I saw one pop up on Instagram. I got, this was a couple of years back when we first released some of the ML tools for lunchbox and someone had cobbled together like a self-driving, like a virtualized self-driving car, basically a car that figured out its way through a racetrack using some of the ML tools. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what a moment. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, you know, and it was, I don't even know if it was like, was it a student? It may have been a student. It may have been yeah, some researcher, but I was like, yeah, you couldn't, I'm like, I had no idea you could do that with the the tools that I made. And that's actually one of the more gratifying aspects I of bet. a lot of it is like, if you put something out there, you made it for a particular purpose for yourself, but then when it becomes something that you never intended or became, or become something that it's another author clearly put their stamp on it, I think it becomes way more interesting um, because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you guys have gone down that road now with, with conveyor and semantic and tracer. And, and so, I mean, that was maybe your first foray into productizing digital technology, a piece of software. Right. And, and that's led you down this path, like you said, that was kind of kicked off when you started, when COVID happened because of the uncertainty of all the in-person work that you were doing as well. So, Let's talk about let's talk about some of those tools before we get into the strategy side because I know you you we bookmarked the strategy stuff. I definitely yeah. want to get there. So let's get this the product stuff taken care of. But I the tools that you guys have developed and released as products are absolutely incredible. And like I said, you're kind of creating um, some calm in this world of chaos, helping people get their stuff from one tool to another, or visualizing their data, or making useful tools let's just call it that 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 handle a bunch of different scenarios but maybe you can go through some of those sure yeah so um the the tools that we're talking about here um we can go through each one uh, very briefly the conveyor semantic and tracer are the three um tools that we have available on pg apps our proving ground apps and those were all born out of services initially um mm-hmm. they were tools or the bones of them were tools that were used to solve a real world problem that we as um, consultants were encountering um, whether it had been a building or helping someone compose a dashboard or synthesize some data and at a certain point we realized that hey some of this stuff might be valuable as a generalizable toolkit um, and I think conveyor is the first example of this. Um, the problem of interoperability between different design applications has been an area of interest of mine for, for, for years. Um, if I go back to like rewind the clock to the early days of lunchbox and, you know, 20, you know, two, between 2009 and 2011, I was working on a, a stadium at MBBJ and I think it was one of the first documented use cases of grasshopper at such a large scale. Um, right. we, we were trying to parametrically solve this exterior and kind of interior seating bowl of the stadium with, with grasshopper and kind of computational methods, uh, just to get us in some ways, just because we had to, we had to get our way through the project. And, but there was like this other conundrum with that workflow that we had to figure out was, you know, we're doing this all in Rhino but we needed to get it over into Revit mm-hmm. because that's that's what our firm was using. That's what MBBJ was using and continues to use and the you know, other firms are using it, but we had no like path to, to get there. There was basically some, at that time, we were like looking at novel ways of using SAT, like automating SAT exports and, and imports in just to get the documentation set, get some drawings out. And that kind of woke me up to the fact that all of the systems that we use in this industry are not very well integrated with each other. And if we think about the time waste that occurs 
during a design process, there's a good chunk of that is in figuring out how you can move information um, and data between these these platforms that we need to use. Um, and I have a very, I guess, shop mindedness to me. You know, if I if I think about a, a shop. I have different tools for different purposes and I'm going to grab the tool that's best for the job. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to screw something in with a hammer. I'm not going to try to like saw something off with, um, you know, pair of tin snips, you know, you, you want to pick the right thing. And so I always wondered like, why can't we have that kind of mentality with our tools? And the mm -hmm. thing that prevents a lot of that is like, okay, well, if I use Rhino over here for this purpose, somehow that needs to jump over into Revit to do something else. And maybe it needs to go over to analysis software to do something else. And so um, shortly after I left MBBJ and joined Case, um, which was the company I was with, um, consulting group out of, out of New York City, um, in case any uh, are familiar, it was a acquired by WeWork, which is why Proving Ground as a company now exists. Long, uh, long, long path there. Mm -hmm. But we were interested in, you know, a kind of similar set of, of things. We started to look at different integrations um, between these softwares. I was building up different solutions. One was called Rhinomo, which was a Dynamo Rhino That's reader right. <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um, and then as Proving Ground got started, we got put onto a couple of projects. One was the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, currently under construction, and it looks phenomenal. Um, it's taking a long time, but it looks phenomenal. Hats off to that team for what they've done. And the American Museum of Natural History by uh, Studio Gang uh, was another one that we were involved in. And these two projects had um, challenged us um, at the time, it was just two of us, some really small team at Proving Ground to figure out a way that how we can efficiently move this hyper complex geometry um, seamlessly between these applications and do it in a way that didn't necessarily require us to be at the in the driver's seat because we needed to hand the workflow off to a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where Conveyor was born. We, we needed to figure out a way for these geometries to transfer assuming the end user knew nothing about grasshopper assuming that there wasn't necessarily an advanced like what we would call advanced modeling toolkit but maybe a you know a generalized modeling uh, skill set around knowing how to manipulate rhino models and knowing how to manipulate revit models using more more of the conventional tools and that's where conveyor kind of situated itself and we mm -hmm. kind of built started building up this toolkit that allowed for that to occur and right now it's, um, you know, kind of grown to a point where a number of, of practices have adopted it as kind of their enterprise wide solution, which is really cool. They're like, Hey, all of our designers use Rhino, all of them use Revit. If you're that kind of firm that is using those tools, primarily conveyor kind of becomes a way for them to stitch those two together mm -hmm. and, and offset in some ways the, um, the necessity for the advanced, you know, grasshopper toolkit that is oftentimes as much as powerful as it is, can also become a barrier and cause a bit of a digital divide in an organization. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how we, how we bridge that with conveyor. And it's like, what makes this easy, right? Like you, you talked about those other layers of complexity that not everybody's going to get into. And so dialing it back to geometry and and maybe some data from mm -hmm. this major application to this major application without the grasshopper without the dynamo part how do you make what, what would this look like if it were easy to get geometry between these two and you've created an interface that allows that to happen that's right yeah. and you know i think the other the other thing that's that's fun about that project and and product um, I, th I think of it as a project because a project is something that's ongoing. A product always feels so final. Um, in some ways, I think about these things as projects because they're they're always kind of going. Software is um, never done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's never never done. <laughs> but um, one of the things that became really fun, I think, in you know post twenty twenty, getting into twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two, is that Rhino seven came out and the McNeil folks had developed Rhino inside. Mm -hmm. Um which introduces the kind of the, 
the, the, the ability to directly integrate Rhino into another application. And Rhino inside Revit is like their, you know, in some ways a flagship example of like, mm-hmm. hey, you can now launch Grasshopper within Revit and do with Grasshopper similar things that you might have been doing with Dynamo. Um, oh, and by the way, it starts to solve some of the interoperability challenges between these platforms because they're now kind of directly linked. Well, that became really fun for us because not only did they kind of create the 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 connect the ability to launch Rhino and Grasshopper from within Revit, that pipeline becomes something that a third party developer like ourselves could actively use to expand on tools like Conveyor. So out of the box, you download Rhino inside Revit. You can open up Grasshopper and do Grasshoppery things within Revit. Have a lot of fun with that. Um, but we can also launch Rhino and then use the conveyor translators that we've made and have a direct back and forth from Rhino without having to touch Grasshopper. We're kind of able to use the pipeline that the generous folks at McNeil have been able to carve out yeah. um, to allow us to use our logic and our um, kind of translation methodologies to make the process even easier. So it's it's like... Again, it comes back to that community side of things, right? Like McNeil's part of the community. We're part of the community. There's a lot of people part of this network and their thinking allowed us to expand our thinking. And, you know, we've been work, you know, uh, sharing ideas back and forth for, for a while now. And I think it, you know, it's, it starts to work both ways. And that, that's really, really fun when that happens. In the kinds of geometry that you're sending back and forth, I mean, it's not just boxes, right? It's not just right. rectangles. It's it's like the two examples that you cited, the Lucas Museum and the and the Studio Gang example. I've seen photos of those, and like to actually get that kind of geometry built in the real world as a physical object is incredibly difficult. And tools like yeah. these actually make it possible and easier right. at the same time right like that's a, that's, that's right. kind of a holy grail of of realizing design intent uh, it's absolutely incredible yeah 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 the the uh there's not a single I, you know I, I always like to joke whenever i get when i give a lecture about those two buildings and our digital workflow as that's a part of it um yeah there's not a single straight line in either, either of those either of those projects it seems and um, we had to really, we, we published a, a peer reviewed paper through the, the Acadia conference about some of the stuff that we were doing with novel mesh translation. Um, and historically meshes have been like the bane of every Revit modeler or BIM, mod, you know, anyone that's doing BIM, the bane of their existence. Cause it's like mesh, what can we do with it? We need solids. We need really clean solids, which is, you know, nat- naturally, you know, gravitated, I think a lot of those platforms to being able to, you know, we think about them as boxy modelers, you know, you mm-hmm. can draw, draw these, um, normal normative buildings, um, till you're, you're blue in the face. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but meshes are really, um, powerful ways of conveying complex shapes. Um, and they're, and you can get very like you know they're, they're the basis of you know entertainment software character modeling they're the basis of everything when it comes to just displaying geometry on your screen and so a lot of the 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 workflow development that was done for those projects was about how we can actually capture the mesh in such a way that it can be cut um, that it will look good on a sheet be part of the documentation have a level of fidelity to it that um, is is um, you know uh, supportive of the design intent. You know we don't want it to be too coarse. We don't need it to be too detailed. So we mm-hmm. developed you know ways of you know refining those meshes as part of that whole translation workflow process, and it became such that's you know one of the I think one of the um, more interesting features of conveyor. If we get into the specifics of the different things that translates is how it handles the, the mesh component and makes them usable. Um, and part of, part of BIM in a way that they, I don't think were previously. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's, let's 
could get through your other two uh, as well. So which one do you want to talk about next, Conveyor? Well, I think they, they those are, those two are like companions in, in many ways because they, they touch on business intelligence um, and the idea of telling a story with your data. And when we when I was at Case, um, we were doing a lot of work with Tableau at the time because we were you know basically creating reports to help our clients understand their standards better, like what was in their models, mm-hmm. um, the quality of their of their digital assets. And that kind of experience opened me up to this world of like, oh, well, what if you could actually use data as a storytelling device, much like yeah. you would use a rendering to tell an architectural story um, or a drawing? You know, can you use the data com- data side of all of this to tell to tell um, the story or expand on the story in a way that um, the more conventional modes of architectural representation don't allow? Um, and so. As Proofing Ground was getting started, Power BI was becoming more popular. We were starting to see it pop up on desktops um, of our clients. And, you know, project managers were using it from like a, a scheduling purpose. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you'd see, a, you know, accounting departments using it and, you know, uh, a, a number of other kind of you know, analysts uh, using that kind of tool. And at a certain point it became kind of apparent like well what if what if we could make connections from power bi into the model assets that people were using and not only display the data but display the kinds of representation that we need to be able to tell the story of our architecture um and so that that's where semantic and tracer came into play. And I think Tracer was in some ways first because we had been working with building information models for quite a while and we're very familiar with the Revit um, underlying data structure. And so Tracer started off as a way of, okay, let's get the data out into a database structure. So Mm -hmm. a structure that sits apart from Revit entirely Mm -hmm. um, such that it can then be hooked in to a place like Power BI and we can run analysis on quantities and um, parameter values and element counts and, you know, know, just basically unpack what's in that model. Um, And then that evolved into what if we started to serialize geometry in a number of different ways? What if we could convert the areas of a, of a model to a GeoJSON such that you could start to display it in like a a mapping viewer? and then what if you were able to take the three-dimensional geometry of a Revit file and turn it into a, uh, a set of meshes that could then be rendered in a 3D viewer? And can we, could we even get a 3D viewer in Power BI was, was another kind of big part of that question. And so um, Tracer was born out of like, okay, we're gonna, we have a data analysis thing. We need to get the data out. And then the viewers became a way for us to then stitch it all back together in Power BI. And with that information, a designer or an architect or a project manager can compose a story with, within Power BI that tells them something about their building. And I was just on a phone call earlier this week, a <laughs> phone call. No one does phone calls anymore. It was a Zoom call. <laughs> um, of course, of course like, it was. I just, I feel like, I, I feel like I'm just constantly like dating myself in this, in this combo. Again, we'll leave it up to the viewers to decide if I've become more or less unhinged since 2020. It's okay. We're, we're, we're recording this episode right now on, on VHS. So yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. that's my comfort area. Right. Hey, perfect. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a relief. Um, actually that'd be really funny if you like published like a really grainy VHS yeah. quality of this, <laughs> this recording. <laughs> We're just one Which, filter the, away from that. <laughs> si- si- sidebar. And um, before I get back on topic, I'm going to take myself off topic. Um, I got my son into music um, in this last year. And the way I got him into music is I bought him a, uh, it's not an original, but it's something you can, you can get, you can still get them on Amazon, um, kind of a knockoff Walkman. Nice. And I found a bunch of cassettes that my parents had that I used to listen to. Oh, cool. And then I went on eBay 
and found a bunch of stuff that that I used to listen to as well. And so now my son is into music through a growing cassette collection. And this is one I haven't given to him yet. Um, he's nine years old. He's, uh, you know, he's into rock and stuff like that. But I also have been giving him the Guardians of the Galaxy. You can you can buy new stuff on cassette. Are you so this is the Guardian <laughs> Galaxy Volume 3 nice. uh, cassette that I bought off of Amazon. And it's That's awesome. cool. So have you introduced him to a number two pencil yet and, and the usefulness of that with, with, uh, Oh yeah. He knows, he knows how to use it. He knows. How, oh, Oh, you mean to re, to, to, to unspool. Yeah. I, I did. I did take him through a demo of that because he ended up his, his cassette player ended up chewing up, uh, yep. Metallica's yep. ride the lightning <laughs> a couple of weeks back. So I had to like, I had to like, go. Oh, this is how you fix it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So cool. I actually, it's funny that you say that cause I just saw, and I wanted it so bad. I just saw an iPhone case that was a cassette tape, like an old school Maxell or RCA tape. So, so from the back, your phone actually looks like a cassette tape. That's sweet. It's really sweet. Yeah. So how do we get on this? We got on the subject because I said phone call. And yeah, you were on a phone call right, earlier this week. I was like, yeah, I was on, I was on a phone. I was on phone. I was on the telly. Great. And uh, <laughs> um, so they. Th- the comment back or the question to me was like, Oh, what use cases have you seen with tracer? And I couldn't, I couldn't answer the question in a very straightforward way because they were looking to like, Oh, this is primarily used for like space planning, you know, Mm -hmm. or like Mm -hmm. showing the program in 3d or, or showing something else. I was like, well, we've seen a lot of them. So there's the planning and programming stuff that architects like to use like space tracking and, you know, Mm -hmm. showing blocking and stacking of, of rooms. And then we've seen, um, an uptick in contractors downloading the tool because what they want to do is they want to take the Revit model, turn it into a database and then, and then attach a power BI to like their costing and scheduling database, and then create a dashboard that shows like a timeline of construction or shows element installation and and tracking over time and we've seen owners using it for um you know maybe as a component to their digital twin solution where it's like oh yeah we're gonna have power bi and that's going to be attached to this real-time database that's giving power bi x information about um, our facility um and the 3d piece is you know there to to convey the model and so people are like really scrapping together interesting use cases out of it again in unanticipated ways um, we've had, um, and speaking of unanticipated ways, you know, we've had people that are in like biomedical, um, and, and chemistry, like wanting to show wow. digital models of, you know, biology or like DNA structures, like, Hey, will this help us show like the mesh of this, of this structure over here, this, this chemical structure and combine with the data that we're collecting. I'm like, Sure. Why not? I know nothing about this. In fact, I became, I came very close to failing chemistry when I was in high school. Um, but I'm the last yeah, person you it. want to ask that. <laughs> yeah. I'm the last person you want to ask, but yeah, 3d sure. But you, right. I don't want to, I don't I know nothing about what you do. Um, but yeah, so that it, 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 the versatility of the business intelligence platforms like power BI, um, and others really start you know, it, it, to me, it becomes a really interesting design tool in a way we're in, yeah. instead of designing your, I, I think, I think back to when I was in school or even when I was doing a lot of competition work in, in designing your design, your board, you know, and you have your rendering and you have maybe some, you know, the diagram, right. you know, and, you know, power BI is like, well, what if you, gave a gave an owner or gave your client a dashboard that lets right. them explore right. that in a way and and do so in a way that you've curated and you've you know you've published as a designer that, that... and be fully interactive i think i rem- i'm remembering a, one of your au classes that i attended years and years ago where you were basically showing this at its initial state i think and because you had like the revit uh you know example project in yeah. Power BI. I don't think it was 3D yet. I think it was just 2D right. at that point. And you were just typing in a query and it was 
I isolating that. information and showing yeah. you like how many classrooms are in this building. It was like you could ask it a question in regular language and it would kind of parse that and filter that data down and just show you what you were asking. And, and I, I remember just like opening up my eyes to the possibilities here for allowing someone else who is not a designer, who's not working in Revit, who's not working on the project to be able to track progress, answer questions with a client, make sure that you're on track with the program, like all the pieces are there, that the sizes are right. It was, and it was just, it, it was amazing to see using a, a completely different tool to kind of look through that into the model, but, but something that anybody could access. And I think that's what really was, was eye opening to me about it back then. Yeah, I think, I think there's something like, and this in some ways feeds into our, you know, we can maybe lightly touch on the strategy stuff here because there is a underlying philosophy mm -hmm. in play when it comes to that, that ad, I guess you can call it an attitude or a, an approach. Um, if you can give someone, give a non-expert um, information or data that once previously required an expert, but you're giving it to them in a way that they can then uh, digest and understand, you've, you've all of a sudden set up um, what in my view would be like the foundational part of a digital transformation. Di digital tools and technology are not transformational if they are relegated to a select few, in my view. They need to be something that a lot, it allows us to have them opened up to a cross-section of, mm -hmm. of stakeholders, uh, of people, um, such that they can participate. And when I think about the you know, the, you know, uh, power BI, um, and the stuff that we're, you know, doing with semantic and tracer, it's really about that. It's about people like people to compose a model, uh, uh, whether it's a Rhino model or a Revit model that requires expertise that requires someone to go into, to the, to the 3d world, um, and construct their, their model. Mm -hmm. Um, but then if you have publishing tools, stuff that allows you to take that information and put it in a way that with a nominal amount of knowledge of how you might rotate a 3D view or click on a bar graph and see the, see the impact of that selection on a model, um, you've all of a sudden made a, a, an opaque process far more transparent and allows for more people to participate than were participating previously. And then you've created the you know, some, some level of foundation for a transformational conversation. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would say like to, to be really specific about it is you're letting them drive. And, and that is, that's a big deal because you, you could do everything that you just said by watching over someone's shoulder sure. who is the expert driver, but to actually give them the, the steering wheel is mm -hmm. a completely different game because it's actually starting to create a relationship between the person and the data not not even the tool necessarily but but like what what are the answers that they're trying to get and that creates a level of transparency it creates a level of accountability to build trust in the system and build a relationship with the people who are allowing or enabling that even to happen and that there, there's way bigger impacts to that 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 allows for on, on a pro, for a project than than without it, and that's where mm -hmm. that transformation can actually gain a foothold. Because yeah. if it's if it's just tools and there's no trust and there's no relationship, then it's just tools. Like it, it doesn't make, it doesn't actually make a difference. Yeah. Well, and I think um, there's there's another aspect to it that I think is also really important is that it somehow there needs to be a bit of a fun side to it. Um, Agreed. Like we've seen many dashboards, you know, reports and things like that, that just by the, you know, that that contain a lot of really good information, but just by nature of them being boring as hell, no one wants to look at them <laughs> right. or ga gain any insight. And, and so when I think about 
this idea of composing and publishing mm -hmm. and the, uh, the the element of creativity that can go into it. It's in some ways like designing a game. You want the game to be fun. Right. You want there to be self-discovery by the person playing it. And so you, as a designer of, say, your dashboard that has attachments into BIM um, or uh, Rhino or any of these other applications, you want it to be such that there's a level of intuition. There's a level of like, I want to go deeper and you want to encourage this kind of interaction with the data um, that helps helps that end user become educated, mm -hmm. but also have fun with it along the way. Like, hey, I've never seen this before or hey, isn't this cool? Um, and, you know, if, if we're if we can create tools that are helping designers compose in that way, then I think that's that's where we want to be. Yeah, I, I love that idea too because I, you 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 use the analogy of like laying out your boards when you were in school, right? And yeah. and you're placing views on sheets, probably in in design or back in my day it was Quark Express, right? And it yeah, was, right. <laughs> it was like that you you draw a frame and then you decide what you're going to put in that frame. It could be text, it could be an image. Now it's a fully interactive three D model that if you click on this frame over here, it's going to isolate that information and it's going to update in these other views to reflect kind of the thing that you're drilling down into, but it creates that it's another level, right? Because of the interactivity than, than just the 2d boards on the wall were, and it encourages exploration and it encourages yeah. someone to scratch an itch and find out something that isn't just apparent on the surface. It is deeper. And that is what's so interesting. I think about architecture in general, is real architecture does that as well in a spatial way. Maybe it does it with light. Maybe it does it with color. Maybe it does it with texture. Maybe it does it with the size and proportion of the room. But we're talking about using this to get us there. And, and this right. building this relationship along the way, using tools like this that enable that to happen, is a fantastic way to deliver that project and include people in the process along the way. Right. Right. Yeah. Super cool. Um, there's also, you know, there's an element here where there's, there's also a, I think a component to what we do that also operates, you know, we're, we try to do new things. Um, but we also build on what's there, um, in, in many ways, mm -hmm. you know, we're not proving ground isn't a company that we're not designing our own ground up platform, you know, which I think requires a, a, a very different kind of business model, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have amazing kind of platforms being built by the ground up by the folks at like Hypar um, and, 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 and others out there, right? Um, we, we are, you know, building tools that naturally extend things that people are already familiar with to a degree. So like conveyor, you know, Rhino and Revit are known commodities in the world of design. We're trying to introduce another level of integration in there. Um, Power BI is a well-established product, um, and the idea of creating, you know, web viewable, um, you know, 3d reports is also somewhat familiar, but we're, we're trying to layer in this idea of ease of accessibility and, you know, the idea of like a no code type of environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also been advantageous because it allows us to tap into existing infrastructure. If we're able to sort of say like, hey, our tools work with your stuff um, because that's what they're designed to do. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's a, you know, there, there's an appetite there to be like, oh, okay, we don't, we don't need to overhaul our entire kind of IT or software infrastructure to right. get to this capability you're talking about. You're naturally yeah. extending and taking us to a, to a place that is um, built on what we have as our skill sets and our, our infrastructure and, and taking it to another, another level. It reminds me of like old car magazines where it was like bolt on performance. Right. And it was like, right. anybody can do it. You know, uh, that's the idea, right? It's like, you've already got the, the building blocks in place. You have the expertise and now you're just going to extend the capabilities or get a little bit more with just an, an add on that, that helps do the things that other word in other ways are extremely difficult to do. You couldn't piece that right. together yourself without an extremely, large amount of effort right so right yeah. 
yeah, the value in the tool is, is kind of obvious the first time you use it. Right. So let's talk about this strategy thing. I mean, you're, because this, I think does kind of provide the gateway into that part of the conversation, right? Because this is where you're now addressing the other people in the room, right? And mm -hmm. you're, because a lot of times I think the, the software, the, the startups are focused on the actual users of the software, but there's this whole other world to the business of architecture where there's decision makers and stakeholders in many different levels beyond the actual users who are delivering the projects, right? They're, they're, That's right. And there's, there's even different layers there, right? There's, there's the, the juniors and the mids and the seniors and, and the, everyone kind of touches things in a different way. But then you've got that on the, you know, the overhead side as well of, of the business. Uh, and, and so I'm interested to kind of hear what you've been noticing in the business of architecture and how you're helping address some of the digital transformation side of that with the tools that you're releasing, but also with the, the strategy and the, you're, you're doing your own kind of analysis of these firms, right? To help mm -hmm. them understand the landscape that they're in, how they're participating in it in ways that in which they may, may not even be aware of because you mm -hmm. get to, you get to step back and you get to look across the entire landscape. Yeah. So uh, strategy, the strategic work that we do um, was really among, I, I think, some of the earliest consulting uh, pro uh, projects that we've been a part of. It, it's sort of been the way that we're able to connect and create, I think, meaningful collaborations from. Mm -hmm. um, and you used the term earlier, the idea of trust, because mm -hmm. trust is really the the currency that I think a good strategy relies on in order mm -hmm. to make it actionable. There needs to be trust between, you know, I would say we call us maybe coaches, coaches and right. people that we're helping to coach. And there also needs to be trust among the stakeholders within a business to um, realize the potential of the things that they're interested in realizing. Um, and so the, the strategy work that we do is, yeah, I, I call it the third, you know, it's like the 30,000 foot um, view of, of an organization and what the impact of digital can or is, can and should be within that, within that company. And I think there's, there's a misconception usually right off the bat that we're going to come in and we're going to tell them which tools to use. And then that's going to solve it. Um, or that we're going to come in with a, uh, a new set of technologies that they've never heard of before. And that's going to be something that they're going to implement as the next stage. What, what more often is the case is that an architectural business or a construction business or an owner operator business, they, ha they, they might have a lot of the tools and the technology in place to some degree. And it's right there. I mean, it's like right on their desktop in some way. Mm -hmm. But what they're missing is the attention to process um, and the attention to people and their skills in order to, to, to motivate the organization to really see the benefit. Um, as part of, you know, it's, it's part of a lot of my introductory talks that I give on the subject of strategy. Um, it deals with two components to a successful strategy. There's this idea of the smart component. Like, and we all, we, we've heard the term smart business, you know, work smarter, not harder, mm -hmm. um, and those types of things, right? That, that, that refers to like, okay, you have the technology, you have the tools, you might have different tactics that you're employing those tools with. Um, but then there's, and the, you know, maybe knowledge management's a part of that, kind of yeah, the smart absolutely. side. Right. right, content management. It's like the nuts and bolts that go into making a, a smarter organization. But then you also have the health side. So smart and healthy. Healthy is the, the part that is far more challenging to address in a strategic way and actually requires way more effort and attention from people that are non-technologists, sure. which is why I really like this. Because yeah. what you have to do within a, in my view, a healthy organization is an organization that 
has levels of accountability for certain initiatives that are taking place. There is maybe even a sense of, of equity um, within an organization, i.e. equity, in both in terms of how, how you're thinking about how a certain cap capability can spread equitably across uh, staff, but also people that might be contributing to that, are they getting an upside from it? Mm -hmm. um, in a, in a meaningful way in their work and their paycheck, you know, something like that. There might, there's also uh, communication, um, something far overlooked, like, Hey, you have a new thing. How is it being like talked about in your right. company? Right. And, and then there's the, the big B, which is behavior as part of the, the healthy side is your team set up in such a way where they are being motivated to change the way they do things. And that one right there is probably the, you could call it the biggest speed bump or barrier uh, in any organization when it comes to digital transformation. Um, and I'm sure you've heard it in many of the places that you've worked. Why are you doing something a certain way? The answer is usually, well, that's just the way I've always done it. <laughs> and there's very little right. motivation to push an individual to sort of be like, well, maybe I should look at it a different way or change the way I'm, I'm working. Yeah. Um, and so this is why this you have to engage those leaders as well, because that, right. th that mentality comes out of, uh, I mean, I don't have time to look at another way to do it. I don't know that there's a better way to do it. And the project has been built around slicing up time in the way that we've always done things. And so right. therefore you give me that amount of time to do the thing. I will take that amount of time to do the thing. That's right. It's a, it's, it's like, it's like a, it's a B the, the B is for behavior of the B is also for bias, mm -hmm. right? It's like they have through, through their professional upbringing, through, through our, the habits that we build, the rules of thumb that we cultivate. Mm -hmm. These are great things in many respects because it allows us to work. You know, we, we are gaining experience. We are developing rules of thumb. We are figuring out faster ways to shortcut problems that we always encounter. These are necessities for us to be successful. But if we're not careful, those um, habits and those rules of thumb can also put the blinders on Absolutely. our ability to see other possibilities. Yeah. And that's kind of what I like to think about our strategy is like, can we, can we come into the room and help take some of those blinders off and help motivate an organization at different levels, whether it's the designer doing the project, or it's the project manager that's trying to figure out how to staff a project appropriately, or it's the executive trying to make a high level um, decision on where to invest in training in, um, you know, in a new capability or how they might be developing a relationship with a, with a prospective client. Can we help them look past maybe some of what they know and get into an area where they might be uncomfortable at first, but recognize that, Hey, this, this new capability can take us where we want to go. Um, and if we can get that kind of attitude in place, um, then the roadmap and a roadmap is usually like the, what I refer to as a roadmap is usually the artifact that comes out of every strategy engagement, kind of sets a near, mid, and long-term set of goals. That roadmap becomes very much easier to execute because you can see where you're going and you have this level of buy-in at these different levels that help people um, know where they're going and know how they are participants in that, in that ride together. So many times someone like you, Nate, will come into a business and do what the thing that you just talked about. You'll create this report, you'll create the roadmap, and then you're out. And then right. they're left to their own devices. And and there maybe are, there maybe aren't some directly responsible individuals for each key element on there. And it tends to, I, I don't know, I guess it's just my experience, but it's like, if there's no one owning it, it doesn't happen, right? It was like, right. we went through the exercise, we checked the box, we realized the things that we never realized before. I, I, I was reminded, I think of 
Donald Rumsfeld's Rumsfeld's quote. Right? <laughs> we have the known knowns, the known unknowns, yeah. and the unknown unknowns. And it's like you don't, you can't fault someone for not knowing what they don't know, and, because they're so busy on the projects, delivering the things, doing it the way that they've always done it, that they're not even coming up for air to kind of s- survey the the current state to see what what else out there is possible. You, as a, this injection, get to come in and kind of show people what what might be possible after you've listened to them um Mm -hmm. i mean as far as efficacy goes to these kinds of uh relationships that you enter into with them i'm sure you've seen it go both ways good and bad but i mean if you were to kind of assign a ratio to it what do you think that that would be for for implementation and success of of those interactions I would, I would say, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have like a, like a statistical like percentage where I could say like, Hey, these, you know, (laughs) folks were at, we're at 80%. uh, Yeah. We're at 80, 20, we're at 80, 20, 80% of the time our strategies work every time. Like, (laughs) I don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can say that uh, with certainty, but what I can say, um, is that there, there, there definitely is the, the breakdown that, that you described there, there are um, companies that we've worked with where we've come in and we've done the strategy. We've even set up the kind of account, like an accountability structure and who's doing what, and then we'll check in on them, you know, six months later, a year later, um, and be like, Hey, how are those? Or, or we'll see them at an event. Be like, Hey, how, how are those, some of those initiatives we worked with you on going like, well, you know, we, we just haven't been able to, to, to find the time to, to do the, um, you know, the machine learning study or, or to, or to, to enact the new training program Mm -hmm. and, you know, but we're going to, we're going to get to it, you know? Um, and, and you, you kind of like, kind of scratch your head a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, You're like, yeah, (laughs) you know, that maybe, maybe that one's not going to pick up steam, but then, then we have the ones that are very like, um, you know, we've had, we've had repeat strategies where it was like, we would do like, like a three-year plan and the, the, the team that was responsible for looking at the, the tactics and the strategies that we'd been talking about was very diligent about going through each one. And they were starting to see results. And at the end of three years, we're now, <laughs> like I said, we're an eight-year-old company. Yeah we're now able to have repeat strategies where they're like, Hey, we're done with our roadmap. We are able to do X, Y, and Z. Let's do another one mm. and look at the next three years based on where we've landed. And they will come to us with a level of confidence that the things that they had done were working out and that the insight we were able to provide was also going to help them elevate them to the next level. And that, that becomes a very, strong relationship and a high trust relationship. And those are, those are two like examples where it's sort of like we do the thing and then we, like you said, might go away for a while or we're not like actively involved in the tactics. You're not actually We've, delivering it. It's up to them right. to deliver it on, on it. Yeah. But we've also been a part of a number of, of strategies that are like, yeah, we'll do, we'll work on the tactics together. And Oh, by the way, like these five over here, are things that we can directly help you with mm-hmm. um, implementing a centralized uh, data warehouse, for example, or setting up, setting yourself, setting them up with uh, training around interoperability, things like that become natural points of entry for us to sure. be more hands-on with mm-hmm. the, with the approach. And I tend to like, obviously I like those more because it's like, oh yeah, it's like kind of more, more business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it's also, I like them because it, it gives us more of a hand in the success or failure of yeah. what the roadmap could be. And I feel like with more involvement, we're able to help continue to give advice along the way. Sure. And that lends itself to a better um, chance at the transformation succeeding. I will say that I have a blog article that states as much and, you know, is, is based on some research. Digital transformation initiatives are really, really hard to pull off. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a statistic out there that 
I did a survey of like big companies that were initiating digital transformation initiatives. They have like an 82% failure rate, <laughs> which is like- There's a number. <laughs> a really high. There's a number. It's really hot. I mean, wow. because what, what happens is, um, and it all comes back to that B word, behavior. Mm -hmm. What they're able to do is you're able to sort of say like these digital transformation initiatives as well-meaning, as well thought out as they can be, if you're not able to, again, attach their success or failure in a way that is relevant to this to a wide range of stakeholders that will see some kind of upside in their work um, then they're going to stick with what's known um, and they're going to stick with the the way that they've always done things and you know and i think is, is especially true in larger organizations where there's yeah. just a lot of complexity a lot yeah. of bureaucracy mm -hmm. a lot of different opinions um and you know it's easy i think with if, if if um, you're an employee in a large company and the kind of upper echelon of leadership comes down like, hey, we're releasing a new strategy. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be related to, um, you know, the, the food service as much as it is the technology that they're using. Sure. Um, but if, if it's one of those things where, it, hey, this is coming on down and my project manager isn't really talking to me about it. And my, um, you know, my principal is just sort of like, okay, whatever, we're going to ride this out for, for three years and then we'll have a new strategy. You yeah. know, there's sort of this element of like, yeah, we'll wait and see, yeah. um, as opposed to, uh, you know, Hey, let's get on this, you know, and that's where you want to get past. You want to get past the wait and see stage and to, and to show results with these strategies that can, can be meaningful to people. You mentioned the word upside, and I'm I'm wondering if you have any particular thoughts about, I mean, it is so important for someone to see upside early, is my guess, right? <laughs> because I don't do what you do. But that makes a lot of sense. And so do you focus on that a lot on the work that you're doing there? Because, I mean, some, you, you said you've got, you've got a short term, a midterm, and a long term kind of staging of the plan. The short-term stuff, I, I would assume, kind of has to show value very quickly so that it even has a chance of continuing to mm. that mid-level point. Just general thoughts on on that kind of thing. Yeah, we call them quick wins. And I'm sure it, it, it's, it's a common terminology, common consulting terminology, you mm. might, might say, that the quick mm -hmm. win. We need a, we need a way to um, demonstrate the value of an opportunity right away so that people can latch on and want to see more. Right. Yeah. Um, this is where I think computational design has an advantage in a way because it's not full blown software development. Right. Um, but you can still develop extremely powerful automation technology uh, techniques and technology that will help elevate a process. And so what we oftentimes see is like, okay, there are these, okay, we need to get some momentum behind um, our data management behind uh, planning and programming. What can we do? Oh, well, you know, uh, let's think about what you're using today and let's prototype something really quick in Grasshopper or Dynamo that allows you to circumvent some waste that we know your teams are dealing with right, right now. And let's do it in two weeks, you know, and develop something that we can get in their hands and, and help them. And because all of a sudden you're taking a high level, I, you know, something that might be super high level in the 30,000 foot strategy view. And you're saying, okay, now we're going to bring this down to a solution rapidly. Uh, that's going to hit the person doing some level of production. Mm -hmm. And so that all of a sudden, can, can generate a lot of excitement and also puts a lot of um, yeah, interest uh, behind the technology initiatives. It was like, oh, I had no idea we could do this. Why, why don't we have more computational designers? Where can we get more training? Um, how can I participate in this, in this training? How can, um, can I sit in on the next uh, strategy meeting so we can talk about what we need? Because we think this could turn into a new uh, tool for us that has broader reach. And, and those quick wins can help, you know, prompt the questions um, and prompt the dialogue. And, you know, when we, when we build software, 
uh, that's 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 part of our I, I think workflow in general is that if we're building something custom, we want to have um, prototypes, we want to have wireframes, we want to have things that take something from the abstract into something that is actually meaningful and we know can deliver, right? Just like the architectural design process, right? <laughs> it's exactly. Like, yeah. it's, it's amazing the parallels there, you know, the, the right. architectural design process, you want to have, you, know, you have your sketches, you have your initial renderings, you go through the different phases of design. Um, that's actually something that uh, we, we've drawn that parallel before and it tends to resonate. It's like digital transformation is just another design problem and you're going through a very similar set of steps and you know you might end up with uh, designs that get discarded and you're going to end up with, uh, and that's think about those as iterations that are yeah. taking you on the path to, to realizing the, the final it's, project. It's, it might be circuitous, right? It might not be right. that straight line that, that somebody really ideally wants, but rarely ever happens, right? And, and you do have to have kind of that that loopy nature to it too, because you learn in the process and then you go back and you, you know, like two steps forward, one step back. You're not going all the way back, but you, you learn something along the way and you're going to continue on from there. Right. I think it creates a level of ownership too. Like you said, you, you have this high level report that the, the highest level people in the company are, are responding to, but then you take it down to the grassroots to the floor and you say, here's a technology that we can introduce that's going to make this person and this process better. And that's going to have an outcome of excitement. And it, it starts to get their gears turning. And now you have both levels working, right? You, you have hmm. a high level and a grassroots level working together to deliver on those strategies, but actually really in a, in a useful day-to-day -day way. And it, I think it does take both to be really successful, right? It's like, you, you've got to see it. You've got to see progress at both ends of the scale and you've got to have ownership at both ends of the scale for it mm -hmm. to have a chance to make it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The, the other thing that, that I was thinking about when you were talking about these reports is flexibility and like the, mm -hmm. is how much flexibility is built in because you're, if you're doing a three year report and I think about what's happened in the last year, it's like the report's got to change, Nate. <laughs> 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 something happened in technology uh the explosion of you know large language models ai as an example would have an effect on digital transformation i would assume pretty obviously right and so maybe I, yeah I, and so i'm just wondering how how do you navigate that as a consultant to these companies building flexibility into your reports or not yeah so um I would say that yes, they, you know, I think uh, yeah, I use the term report. Um, I also use the term roadmap. These are these are very, um, I would say, by nature, meant to be living documents. I was um, the, say that. the the yeah. the early sort of stage stuff, like the near term tactics that are often like outlined, are far more concrete than the late the later stuff. And I think what what they what they also need to do, um, what a, what a good strategy also needs to do is provide some basis of criticality into them, so you have a north star uh, that you're headed towards, and you know what not to get distracted by. Mm. And I think that's one of the more dangerous. We don't think about it as often, but it is one of the more uh, dangerous and area things that can really derail a strategy where it's like, Oh my God, something new just came along and I'm going to table everything else and just look at this new thing. Squirrel. Yeah. Squirrel. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And with technology, boy, is that easy. It's easy. I can look yeah. at my LinkedIn feed right now yeah. and I'll, I'll, I will show you a feed of dozens of people doing the squirrel thing at this moment. <laughs> and I, and, and so what I, what I, what I think is important then is to sort of say like, okay, we know technology is going to be changing and evolving and there's going to be a new thing, but what you need to do as a practice is be able to say like, does this new thing, um, if we critically look at it, does it support where we want to go? Does it take away from where we want to go? Um, or is it just a general kind of R and D and we're just going to kind of wait it out and see what happens. 
Um, and I think in a lot of cases, if we hear something new, there's, there's an element that we, you know, we want to educate ourselves as much as we can about something that is maybe capturing the popular imagination, but there's also an aspect of like, yeah, we're going to wait about eight, between 18 and 24 months to see how it actually mm -hmm. shakes out, to see mm -hmm. if it will, um, be something that is going to concretely move us in a new direction. Um, because you know, the, the, <laughs> there's two sides of an early, being an early adopter, you're, you're basically gambling. You are, you're putting a gamble, you're placing a bet. You're like, Hey, this new thing is going to be the thing, or it's not going to be the thing. And, you know, it's really a 50, 50 shot, you know, sure. um, how many people do Like, I remember when Google glass came out, do you remember that? Like yeah. there, I knew just maybe a, a few people that they were early adopters and they were walking around with the Google glass and they had the thing and it just fell flat on its face. Mm -hmm. And you know, it wasn't the new thing. Yeah. You know, and now, now today you do have some more augmented things, you know, since I, you brought it up earlier, I do a lot of swimming. I've seen, I get ads pushed to me all the time where you can get AR goggles that will show you like all of your stats as you're, as you're doing laps pretty cool that it was like oh this is actually a practical use of that one thing i saw <laughs> that fell fell on its face a while back um so you want you want to you want to have um yeah you want to be careful with the new stuff i think in in a way where you you just want to make sure that you're you're engaging with it in a way that is going to be productive and it's not a distraction mm -hmm. um and you're not going to be sinking a lot of money into something that ends up being a, you know, yeah, it ends up going nowhere. Yeah. You know, there's, cause there's, you know, we, as we know, this world of architecture, you know, you have, you know, there's a business model attached to it where R and D is already really hard to come by um, and justify certain levels of investment. So you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, okay, is this, the metaverse is a good example of this. Yeah, it's it's like, it kind of blew up last year. Right. You know, it was like at first beginning of the year, yeah, everyone was hot on the, on, on metaverse. Yeah. It's like, boom, this is where it's going. And by the end of the year, all those stocks tanked and right. crypto along with it, you know, and it's, it's like, it, 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 there's a level of, of churn that happens in tech that you, you want to build a, a critical view around. So you don't get sucked in, um, in a way that is going to be detrimental to your, to your goal. You talked about that critical look of, of the business over time. And I'm, I was thinking as you're saying that it, it's like, because it's come up on this podcast has come up on my other podcast about how architecture in general, the, the profession is bad at, at looking at itself as a design problem, right? Looking at its oh, business sure. as a design problem. And the way that I just started to think about it as you were talking was it's not like an architectural design problem. It's more like a software design problem in that the mm. software is kind of never done, right? Where a building is like, yep, at some point you hand it over to the contractor and they hand it over to the owner and and then you're on to the next project, right? And, and there's, of course, there's software like that too that just stops getting maintained or whatever. But, right. but for the long running apps that we've been using for decades that have just been like, built up over time and new features added and other ones deprecated. And like, that's what a business is, is much more like. And so right. to, mm -hmm. to really have that critical view in an ongoing way and constantly watching and adjusting and really having, you know, your fingers on the pulse of what's going on is, is of course, this is what leadership and firms are responsible for. Uh, and yet, there's a lot of businesses out there that could be doing a heck of a lot better because mm -hmm. of so many reasons. I mean, the opposite, the opposite of all of this is true. Like, you know, there's one side you don't want to get caught up, but you don't want to have the blinders on where you're going to get, right. you know, sideswiped by something that you didn't know was coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the large language model and the AI stuff, I mean, we're not, we're, that's been a long time coming, you know, it's, it's been there. It's years. been kind of, yeah. pre it's been present in right. the, the discourse. Um, if you were, if you had your pulse on the conversations and the present discourse for a really long time 
And now we're, you know, seeing prompt engines and, and, and things like that, which are, you know, it's making it, you know, it's getting into the popular kind of imagination in a way that it had previously. And people are like, where'd this come from? Like, well, it's kind of been there, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it, it's, it's crazy. I, I think also about the idea of the innovation curve versus the adoption curve. And so you're, sure. you're watching this from a, you I think it's framed in, in your world under the, the guise of digital pr- transformation, right? Which is kind mm-hmm. of the actual adoption of innovation and technology in business to do better, to do more, to what, whatever yeah. the, the outcomes that you're looking for are. What, what do you see as, as there? Because the way that I've described it in talks that I've given is like innovators or and this is a, a belief that, that we've kind of established it within our company that we share is innovators are innovating on top of innovation and therefore the curve is... <laughs> up and to the right. I mean, that's, that's the direction that it goes because it can't, you can't even help it. Like that's, those are the people who think like that naturally are going to do that. And then there's the people doing the work who maybe do have the blinders on in some categories and maybe they're aware of other things in in other categories, but, but the adoption curve is much lower and slower. Mm -hmm. And so that chasm by definition only gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And mm. I'm wondering what you think about about that, because you're actually boots on the ground, even trying to help people get over that gap in their firms. And so how do you how do you see that? Do you see it like that or do you see it differently? No, it's true. I mean, you're, you're really kind of speaking to, um, you know, there's that uh, there's that quote, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you know, that that's very true, um, especially in the world of construction um there are firms that are doing amazing innovative stuff like like you just described it's innovation on top of innovation they're accelerating um and then you have firms that are decidedly not doing that um and they you know i <laughs> i had a i had a a, a call just last week, last two weeks, and I I dropped the term grasshopper. I just said, oh, yeah, you know, we, we built some tools with grasshopper. And they were like, grasshopper, what's that? You know, and legitimate you know, for all intent, legit, <laughs> legitimate question. Uh, so, yeah, I've been trying to figure that out for like the last 13 yep. years. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm really thinking about it. Um, but, you know, we take for granted how uh well established some of these products are and some people just have not have not engaged at all and for all intents and purposes the firm that i was talking with at that point in time was profitable and had a good customer base and was moving along just fine right and i think that's that's like that's an important thing that it's always to have important to have those kinds of gut checks is like just because something is innovative um, doesn't necessarily negate or supersede or override the benefit of of doing things in a way that's already established as well. So like I'm not, you know, I, I think you're right. I think you're you're right that you have you have innovators that are always going to be, you know, moving the curve, moving that curve. Um up and to the right but you know i i think it and this comes back to the air the kind of point i was you know making earlier about being critical about where you're at where you're going um and and maybe it's just who i am um as well because when i was at mbbj you know i was i was the grasshopper guy you know and i love building stuff in in you know grasshopper but I tell you, when it came crunch time, there, there was nothing stopping me from being like, you know what? I'm going to get in these CAD plans and we're going to be yeah. ripping, ripping through camp. the document. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be ripping through these, ripping through the document set. Yeah. You know, like you have to do it and you have to do it to get get by and you need to kind of rely on, on you know, those those experiences too. Mm-hmm. Um, so in many ways it comes down to maybe there's an element of balance there, like there's so much expertise, like 
we talk you talked about the gray hairs in this industry right um earlier and you know <laughs> um and i may be getting to be one of those two um at this point but you know there's so much experience there and just because there's new stuff coming in and just because there are you know highly innovative technologies while you don't want to have people putting their blinders on, you also don't want to negate very well established experience right. on how a building comes together, how architecture gets made. Um, you know, I think you almost you almost want to. We called it. Um, you know, it was kind of there's like a term that we. It was popular there for a while. It's called upward mentoring or reverse mentoring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something we often advocated for in, in, in a lot of strategies. Also, it was something that MBBJ was kind of big on is that you'd pair up um, your, you know, someone that is doing new things and engaging with new content. Maybe it's grasshopper, maybe it's rendering, maybe it's, um, you know, a different form of design, you pair those individuals up with people that are very well established in the field. And you would try to set up a mechanism where they can learn from each other. Yeah. Um, and, and feed, feed, feed forward. So it's not a, a pure dichotomy of people that aren't doing it and people that are doing it. It's yeah. more of like, what can you share in order to make a product, you know, to, to generate kind of a productive transformation that operates in both ways. The Venn diagram. Yeah. The greens and the grays, right? It, yeah. That, that spot, that sweet spot in the middle. It, I, there was a book written by one of the partners, I believe it was in BBJ and it was called designing the design firm. And they did talk about, oh, sure. talked about that in there. That, that's a fantastic book about leadership in design firms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, this idea, and maybe, maybe we should start to wrap up here, but I, I've, <laughs> The whole idea of of that bi-directional. I mean, <laughs> talk about interoperability, Nate. Yeah, uh, that's what we're, that's what we're, that's what it, it all comes down. It all comes back to interoperability, uh, bi-directional exchange of data. It, it is it is about creating these connections between experience and wisdom, right? I mean, it is interesting also to think about those people who are the operators using these maybe high tech solutions early in their career, but not knowing the things that they need to know to actually deliver a project and creating the right. connections between those. Because like you, you talk about, you know, navigating the building code, talk about navigating a stakeholder meeting, talk about getting a client to sign off on something and go to the next level or right. an ad service or, and, and I think it's funny because you always see these uh, analogies being driven toward like the automobile, the automotive industry in design or, or any kind of product based design and applying those ideas to architecture. And look how much better architecture would be if we only did this thing. And it's like it is actually a completely different animal. It is completely hmm. different. How many times does a does a automotive firm engage a customer to ask them their preference when they're designing a car like hardly ever is my guess is the answer to that i'm sure it happens but but like the architectural design process is completely different than that completely hmm. different and it, it's interesting to me to kind of see or listen to you talk about the experience that that you've had throughout your career to navigate like this really complicated thing called an architectural design pra practice, right? I mean, right. It, and it is a practice. It's not, it's not a, it is a project. <laughs> it is this ongoing, yeah. it's not a product. It is a project and it, and it is constantly being reevaluated and the goalposts are always moving and the people who are in those companies are always moving around. And it's a, it is a, it's just this really interesting kind of, uh, What's the word? Organic thing mm -hmm. that's just constantly changing all the time. Yeah, and then you know that that and that's at just a singular business level, right? And it's it's even more true as you get out and think about like the larger team structure that goes behind a project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 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 always interesting to me to for me to think about, hey, when a project team finishes a project 
the odds of that team coming together again in that exact same way to do a project again that's almost identical is also rare. Yeah. You know, and you have to figure out, okay, how are we adapting to a new context with new collaborators? It may even be the same client, but you're paired with like a different contractor, a different mm-hmm. engineering team. Mm-hmm. And you need to you need to think you need to figure out tactics that will help you grapple with that. And um how how can you take one of the big questions we we often ask our clients in a strategic you know from a strategic perspective is like how do you take what you just finished on one project and mobilize what you've learned to support the next one and if you're a firm that has figured that out i think you are in a position that is far better than most um i would say you're in the 99th percentile and you and you even though even if that firm itself is not a digital firm you're probably putting yourself by just figuring that one part out figuring out how you're going to learn from one project to the next and expand and improve you've probably set yourself up to be more of an innovator um than any firm that has the latest cutting edge tools um in my view you've you've created a a healthy organization that is continually trying to learn um, and that you are naturally going to innovate and evolve with technology over time um, because you've, you've, you've mobilized a very uh, healthy behavior. Mm-hmm. I think that's a perfect place to wrap this one up. I, I, All right. We've done a lot. We've covered a lot here. Um, <laughs> I will include links to everything that you've, brought up in this conversation in the show notes for this episode, which I encourage people to read. But if you could just tell everybody where they can find you, that would be fantastic. Sure. Um, so I am, <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. That's probably the primary place you'll be able to connect with me on a, on a professional level. Um, so if you search Nathan Miller on LinkedIn, um, I think my title says something obtuse, like I'm a digital transformation specialist. So look for that. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you can also find proving ground on Instagram and then in the, in the show notes, you should, uh, I'll make sure Evan here has links to my website or the proving ground website, as well as the proving ground app site, where you can try out some of the software I, I've mentioned. Fantastic. Nathan, I am no longer on, I, I was going to say, I'm also, <laughs> No You're longer no, on Twitter or Facebook. That's right. That's another thing that's changed in the last since 2020. A lot of social media has fallen by the wayside for me, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> you are on Mastodon. I, I connected. I am on there. Mastodon. But are we? Network. Are any of us really on Mastodon? Not that much, probably. <laughs> and that's the way I like it. I like being able to sort of let it sit, and I feel like I can just let it sit for yeah. weeks at a time, and then I'll come back to it. Right. Mastodon's great. Awesome. No algorithm trying to keep me addicted. Awesome. Well, Nathan, this is a a true pleasure always to talk to you and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in the near future. We'll see what happens. I hope so too. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having, having me on for part two. All right. Anytime.